Testing. 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 All right. Is everybody ready? 10.04. Sorry for the late start. Somebody broke the other microphone. So, uh, Victoria, hopefully you're there. I haven't seen any conversation yet. Uh, if the mic's too loud, I can move it away from my mouth. Um, font size. Everybody good in the back? Awesome. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, week four. I, I ask you every week, but how's week four going? It's so fun, more fun than the server side. You like manipulating the web pages and stuff, seeing your work. Cool. Do you feel like you have eight more weeks in you to finish off boot camp? As Nima likes to point out, two years ago you would be halfway done. Now you're only 33% of the way done, give or take. All right, but it's it's all it's it's just amazing. Everything that you've built on. Like, you are going to start using it to build out applications. And hopefully you'll see that you're able to build things that you didn't think you'd be able to build when you started here. Um, and it's because you work so hard in those foundation weeks that you'll be able to reap the benefits now. Cool. Okay, so today we are going to talk about client-side JavaScript. Um, what do I mean when I say client-side? What, what's the other option? That is true. There we go. Server side is the other option. Exactly. Um, so we have the option of server side and client side. So where does the server live? What is the, the server? The server is just a computer somewhere, right? A computer that serves things up. 
These could be documents, it could be JSON, it could be almost anything, right? But we control this. This is something that we'll set up. We'll set this up on our local machines. We'll set this up in the cloud, um, something like that. But we're in control of the server. So, and our JavaScript, crucially, runs on this server. If it's a Linux machine, if it's our MacBooks, wherever it is, we're running that. What is a client? for us in in web design. What are we talking about when we say client? Like if we say client side JavaScript, where's this JavaScript going to run? Um, in the app that the user is accessing? Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, it's going to run in whatever device they're using to browse the internet. It's going to be running on an iPhone or an Android or a MacBook or a desktop. Um, but they're going to be interacting with the World Wide Web, the internet work, if you will, um, through their own devices. And they're going to download our code onto their machines and run our code. Okay, so I want you to be clear on the difference between the, what the server is a machine that we set up and we say run this code. Client is whatever our clients are using, our customers are using to interact with our web page. Okay? But it's important that it will always run on their machine and every single person, every single user will get their own copy of our JavaScript file. If we have a thousand users, they'll all get their own versions of it, right? They all have their own little instances running in their browser. Cool. We'll get to this portion. I know you did some weekend, weekend? weekend reading. Um, and we'll get to jQuery in the second half of the lecture. The first half, we're going to talk about the DOM. And I know you also did reading on the DOM as well over the weekend. Um, but first, or second, I guess in this case, I want to talk about APIs because we're going to say it a lot today. So what is an API? Exactly. Application programming interface. Thank you. So what does that mean for us? Can you give an example of an API? Would that be easier? Can you define it through example? Google, I guess, is a web API that we could use, yes. Um, I don't know if most consumers of it would call it an API. At that point, this, wherever it is, there we go. This is an application running in our browser which would be different than an application programming interface. The, I think the programming portion of it is what kind of separates. This is what we would call a, a graphical user interface or a GUI. Okay? This is one way to interface with data. This is one way to interface with the web. But if we're talking about an application programming interface, are just regular, I can't really say regular people, non-technical people, are they going to be programming? Are they going to be interacting with an API or knowingly interacting with an API? No. Okay, so um, remember when I introduced you to Promises and we ran the callback heck application and then we ran the promise-based one and we talked about the fact that we didn't care about the implementation that was underneath? That was an API. That was a programming interface. We had written some code that would be executed by someone else at some point, but the implementation has been completely abstracted away. Okay, so uh, we can talk about like, uh, people usually talk about APIs as like um, your HTTP server and your RESTful endpoints. You'll hear people talk about that as an API because that's how other devs can access your resources things that are sitting in your database or resting on your server, they can visit endpoints in your API. Um, it can also be a bunch of code that exposes functions and objects for us to consume. And this is how we'll mostly see it. Uh, as an example, there's a great one that we use all the time. I'm just going to pop into the REPL here. Make that a little bigger. Console. 
Console is an API that we use pretty much every single day, right? And what does console allow us to do? It allows us to interact with standard out, right? Um, if I say console log, hello, properly, with proper syntax, there we go. Standard out says hello. Do we know how this string was written to the console? We just kind of take it for granted, right? We're like, we execute some code, we utilize someone else's API, and then it has the output that we want. So do we need to think about it any further than that? Right? So we're going to see a lot of these in a lot of these helper methods in the browser. And so we're going to say the word API a lot. So hopefully that's clear about exactly what an API is, or at least you could give examples of an API. Okay. So let's move on to today's topic, client-side JavaScript. Okay. I think the easiest way to demonstrate it, so your terminal was your best friend when you were developing Node applications, right? You would output stuff to it, you would read things in from it, you would see using Morgan or some kind of logger output from your API as people were hitting your endpoints, right? We can't use this on the server side, or on the client side, because this is, by definition, on the server. So we have a different console that's super, super small. There we go. This is our best friend on the browser. This is where all of our console logs will show up. This is the equivalent of our REPL. We can actually run code. Has anyone tried this to run code right in here? Hey, look at that. We can run code right in inside of here. Let's clear this. Um, the other thing that Nima likes to point out is you can press pretty much any letter and you get autocomplete. And you can look through this stuff. And so there's an awful lot of things that are built into the browser that we didn't have access to with Node. Because a web server doesn't need to do things like DOM manipulation and things like that, right? So we don't need to... Your server is never going to be interested in... Uh, is there... In the battery manager. Like we have access to the battery on the device. We can actually check the levels. Uh, where are we? Battery manager. Let's invoke that. Let's see what happens. Illegal constructor. Okay, apparently it's expecting more than just passing in the battery manager. Um, but we have access to all kinds of things. Let's take a look at the navigator object. Uh, we can see Netscape is apparently the name of the navigator that I'm currently using. That's interesting. What else do we have? Uh, we could see the clipboard. Oh, apparently I was experimenting last night and added something to the clipboard. There we go. Um, so we can do pretty much anything that we want inside of this, just like inside the REPL. Uh, we should be able to run... There we go. Clear that code out of there. Awesome. So why is it that I can, I can do this? Over here, yeah, I can't just type in... Well, maybe Bash will forgive this, but... Nope. Bash, command not found. Console.log, hello. That doesn't work, right? I've got to go into a special application called Node, go into the REPL, and then I can start typing in JavaScript. But I didn't have to activate anything here, right? We get... Uh, there's only three languages that your browser understands. What are those three languages off the top of your head? JavaScript. Yeah, JavaScript is one. Java. Uh, the browser doesn't natively understand Java. It would have to be translated to something else. Uh, you used it yesterday. Nima gave a two-hour talk on it. HTML, that's one. And what's the last one? <laughs> CSS. CSS, close enough, yes. So we've got HTML, yes, thank you, Caitlin. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Those are the languages that we can utilize in the browser. And every browser has been optimized for those. Um, so we always have JavaScript running. Remember when I talked to you about Node was uh, the V8 engine pulled out of the Chrome browser? 
and then a bunch of stuff was added to it so you could turn it into an HTTP server or a TCP server and things like that, right? We could bring in other packages. Um, well, this is where JavaScript was born. This is what it was made to do, okay? In 1995, famously, uh, Brendan Eich created the JavaScript programming language in 10 days. Um, but to put that into perspective, uh, he, he created a tool very, very quickly. And we need to separate out like what you can do with that tool from the tool. If I gave you 10 days, could you make me a hammer? Presumably, right? And then I could set about using that hammer to build things, right? And possibly amazing things. But at no point would somebody say, this was all because somebody took 10 days and built a hammer, right? So I don't want you to get hung up on like, created this programming language in 10 days. That's super genius. Um, it's what we do with the tools that is amazing, right? So we have our HTML, our CSS, and our JavaScript. That Everything is already loaded in the browser. Um, so now we can talk about the DOM. You did a reading on the weekend. What is the DOM? So, document object model, exactly. Document object model. Uh, so what does that mean? You did a two hour reading? Anything? Okay, cool. Let's talk about it again. So what the browser does is, uh, let's just structure out a super quick uh, web page. Let's touch index.html. There we go. And so everything starts with your HTML, right? We need to wrap this. Technically, we need a doc type declaration, right? Don't even remember how doc type works. There we go. Back in the old days, you used to have to actually declare what type of HTML you're running, and the doc type declaration was humongous. Fabio, you remember? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Uh, you don't have to deal with that anymore. This is like a golden age of web development. We have gotten rid of so many roadblocks, so many impediments, and now it's just nice and smooth, and everyone has settled on HTML is the only markup language. CSS is the only styling language. JavaScript is the only scripting language. It made it nice and straightforward for us. There's no more, remember, the browser wars and everything. Everybody had their own competing versions of things probably don't remember the browser wars. Your parents will remember the browser wars. Okay. A new Coke. Okay. <laughs> and inside of here, we have a head, right? And we might do something like put a title in here. And where does this title end up? The <laughs> it will actually end up in the DOM, um, but it ends up on the top tab, right? Anything that you put inside the head, here's your title. This is where your meta information will go. And then we have our body, of course, and this can be filled with H1s and stuff like that, right? So this is the structure of an HTML page. But we can't interact with this with CSS. We can't interact with this with JavaScript. This is just a text file, right? We Have you done any parsing, reading in of text files, anything like that? Um, Normally, when you read in a text file, then you have to go through it line by line. You might have to s remove all the line breaks. You've got to parse it yourself. But we don't have to do that, do we? I can just hop into here, and I'll explain this in a second, but we could say query selector uh, h1 and see if we get anything. Okay, there's no h1s on this page. What do we have on this page? Let's just grab the body. Hey, look at that. Using some magical JavaScript that we'll get to in a second, I've got the body of the web page. I was able to grab it. But did I grab it by going into the literal index.html and like pulling from the body? No. We can't actually interact with this. In order to make this interactive, we have something called the DOM, the document object model. And I think MDN kind of sums it up very well in a roundabout way. Where are we? There we go. Okay. Hopefully this is a good one. The document object model is a programming interface. Hmm? 
Huh? Okay, for HTML and XML, don't really need to worry about XML anymore. Um, documents. It represents the page so that programs can change the document structure, style, and content. And the DOM represents the document as nodes and objects. That way, programming languages can connect to the page. So, in other words, the browser is creating this to help us out. It's creating this document object model in memory, which is an actual data structure that we can interact with. And that's how our CSS is able to connect with our HTML, and that's how our JavaScript is able to edit our web pages. Okay? It's because the browser is doing this magic for us and creating the DOM for us. Um, cool. Any questions about the DOM? Awesome. So let's see if we can find some images of the DOM to better. Uh, from your reading, what type of data structure is the is the DOM? Come on, there's got to be a good one here. Document, root, element. That's not bad. Okay, good enough. Open a new tab. There we go. Ooh, okay. There we go. Awesome. So this is a rudimentary design of the DOM. At the top, the root of our DOM is the document, the document itself. And inside of that, then we have an HTML element. And a child of the HTML element is the head and the body. The HTML element has two children. Below the head, we have a title. And then the title actually has its own node underneath it called text. And that's where the text of the title lives. Okay. And on the other side, we have an element with a body that includes an element. There's an anchor tag with some text and an attribute, an href that points somewhere. And then on the other side, we have an h1 and some other text. And what type of data structure is this? If you're easily motion sick, look away. Uh, it's a tree. That's exactly what it is. It's a shrub. It's a shrub. We refer to this as a tree data structure. And there's some important aspects to a tree that make it perfect for holding the DOM. One of the things about a, a tree is that each node can only have one parent. Try not to read it. It'll probably make you dizzy. Um, but each node, and if you look at that, and if you look inside your HTML, you'll see that each element has one and only one parent element. Okay? But they can have an unlimited number of children element elements within them. And that's kind of the, the thing about trees. They're made up of a whole bunch of different nodes that are all connected together. And there's one parent and unlimited children. Okay? Parent with two children, parent with two children, parent with two children, new parent element, no children. Okay? Uh, so... If this is what, uh, close enough. Oh, I had it. Uh, where is it? There we go. Um, good enough. I'm still playing with it. It's it's avant-garde. It's a Dutch angle, right? Okay, cool. There was at least one laugh for Victoria. There was one laugh. Okay. Um, so we know that the browser is going to take our HTML and turn it into the document object model. What if we do the reverse? as a thought experiment. What if we take the DOM and turn it back into HTML? Does that sound like fun? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Nodding heads. Perfect. Okay. So let's remove that just for right now. We've got our duct type. Okay. So what's our very first element? We'll start at the root. We've got an HTML element, right? So, oh, there we go. We've already got our HTML element. This HTML element has two children a head, and a body. Okay, so let's add the children in. Head, and body. And we use this tabbed in nesting structure to show what is a child of what. This makes it very difficult to see where exactly the head is, but if we keep tabbing in as we keep creating children, then it's easier to see where they belong. As well as, uh, am I going to get it? Well, at least I'll get this auto-fold. Once we start adding content in, we also have the ability to fold, which is handy. Okay, so we've got a head and a body. And then we're moving down. Let's look inside the head. The head has a title. 
element inside of it. Awesome. That sounds pretty easy. There we go. And inside of that, we have something called my title, which is a text element. My title. There we go. So this is a little node that we uh, get created for us. We don't actually have to create this node. Um, whatever is between an element becomes that text node. So whatever you put in here, if this was a button, then a button would have a text node underneath it that holds the text that you're interested in. That'll become important later when we want to dynamically edit it. Because you wouldn't just say, grab the title and make it X. Because it's not like JavaScript where you're like, okay, I'm just going to grab the title off of the page. Maybe you're going to be like page.title equals new title. Something like that. We can't actually interact with it by just saying title. We actually have to grab that text node and say make the text something. Okay? Okay, moving on. The other side of the tree. So we have our body, and inside of that we have an anchor tag and an h1. Anchor h1. Awesome. Then we have an href element in there that points to something and a text of my link. Great. href. Let's just have it point to this page. And my link. Awesome. Oh, sorry. That was... Strip that off. There we go. I actually put it on the anchor. And an h1 with a title, or a text that says, my header. And there we go. We have turned the DOM into HTML. And if I loaded this up in a web page, where's my copy path? Let's see what it actually looks like. It's going to be amazing, I know it. Oh, there it is. Look at that. That's actually maximum. Okay, so we have my link, no surprise to anybody, and my header. And if we take a look at this in DevTools, we should see that we have a head element. And inside of that, when we drop it down, we see that we have a title. And if we look inside the body, we see that we have an anchor tag and an H1. Great. No surprise to anybody, right? Fairly simple. Everything matches up. Um, any questions about what's going on here? Should be fairly simple. Very straightforward. Right? Victoria, all good? Awesome. Okay. So, let us move on. Where, where did we arrive at? The document object model allows us to interact dynamically with the web page. Cool. So let's see what else we have. Oh, we've got some DOM events. Awesome. Uh, what do you suppose a DOM event is? If I console.dir, um, yeah, let's console, let's see what happens. Console.dir, uh, the document. Let's take a look at this thing. So the document is the DOM represented in memory. If you want to access the DOM, you call a method on the document. So let's take a look at what the document actually is. Ooh, ooh, that's pretty cool. I want to illustrate this because I saw it. I just learned about it yesterday, and I think this is so fantastic. Has anyone ever heard of console.dir? Uh, it's similar to console log, but instead, the output is presented as a hierarchical lister listing with disclosure triangles. Yes. Yes. Did anyone realize that these were called disclosure triangles? I think that's fantastic. Okay. So we can hit the disclosure triangle and amazing. Amazing. Check this out. This, is, this has all of our information about our document in it. Uh, if we scroll down till we start finding some things, we see that we have a base URL, which is the URL. I loaded it from the file system. So instead of HTTP, it's using the file protocol. Um, we see that the page has a character set. Um, cool. HTML, all collection. So every element that's inside of here, we can see that we have the HTML, the head, the title, the body, an anchor tag, and an H1. We have access to all of that. And then let's look inside the body. Oh, wow. Look, the body has child nodes inside of it. Text, anchor, 
another text node. We can look inside that and we can see what it is. Oh, it's got some siblings. Let's take a look. Here's our H1. We can look at that. We can dive into this. This is an absolutely massive object and it gets created for us every single time we load up some HTML on the page. Okay. Um, what's interesting for the events is anything that starts with on is an event that can happen in the browser. So we have on abort, on auxiliary click, on before copy. How's the font size? Is that big enough? Um, on before paste, on blur, on click. Hey, that one sounds good. On close, on copy, on cut. We have access to all of these events. On pointer leave, on rate change, on reset, on resize. We can access any of these and just like we did with creating our web servers when we said when this event happened so what was an event that we were listening for when we were creating tiny app uh clicking in tiny app you had to um sure but we took advantage of html's default submission right for that one we we didn't actually we weren't actively listening for that event right um Think on the server side. We actually wrote event listeners on the server side. The way that you can easily identify an event listener is it's code that doesn't execute as soon as you run your program. Sorry? When someone connects to the server, they would have connected in what way? They don't just establish, they don't just like SSH into your server. How did how did your client interact with your server? They made GET requests or POST requests, right, to certain routes. And then we would do something like right, app.get and then a particular path to a resource. And then what did we do? We registered a callback function. We were saying when this event happens, fire this callback function do this asynchronously. So we were actually, I'll drag that around, we were actually setting up event listeners. So what an event listener is, is it's the callback function that fires in reaction to an event happening. A user clicks on something, they mouse over something, uh, they leave the page, they save their work, they press the submit button. These are all events that are happening all of the time in the DOM. And I want to illustrate that. Um, so I like to think about events as someone standing there screaming that something happened. Someone's just yelling out, I got clicked, I got clicked, I got clicked. Right now, there are events firing on this page. Every single time I click, every single time I move my mouse around, there are events firing. What we need to be concerned with is where we attach the listeners to, where we want something to say, where we want our JavaScript to say, when someone screams out, I got clicked, I want to run some code in response to that. But the events are always happening. So let's see if we can document dot, ooh, add event listener. I like that. Let's add an event listener to the body. I think that's the syntax. Document dot add event listener. Here we go. Event target. I like that. Oh, we have to target it. OK. so. Perfect. Let's just add it to the document for right now. Document dot add event listener. Uh, we want to say when the body gets clicked. Actually, let's do um, mouse move event JavaScript. There we go. Mouse move event. I like it. Okay. Examples. Examples. Let's get down to the example. Client X and client Y. That sounds fun. Cool. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to add an event and we're going to do it on mouse move. And then we need to attach, oh, it's telling us a listener and a listener is simply going to be a callback function. Okay. So we're going to attach a callback function. And right now I'm just going to console log. Hello, just to see what happens. So if we read this code out document, so grab the entire DOM, everything that we see here, the whole of the web page, and add an event listener that listens for the mouse move event. 
whatever the mouse pointer moves around. And then when that happens, fire this callback function. Cool. Let's log that. Awesome. And now we can see Victoria, there were gasps and surprises. Like everyone is shocked. Okay. So we can see, thankfully, it's not just outputting hello, hello, hello a million times. It recognizes, the browser recognizes that it's outputting the same thing over and over. Yes. For Victoria, the question was, can you use this for malicious? What's the word? To, to spy on your users. Can you see where people are moving their mouse around on the web page? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, there's actually a fantastic resource where it draws a heat map on your page of where users clicked around and where their mouse was and how they interacted with your page. And we can use it to design better websites. Um, but we can also absolutely see everywhere that someone went. Uh, you can look inside their history of the tab that they were using. You can see the last site that they came from. Um, you can see pretty much everything that's going on on the user's computer. Uh, in the user's window in this tab and where they've been. Okay, So if you want to hide what you're doing for whatever reason, you don't want Facebook to track you, just open a new tab and you've got a nice clean window with no, no history okay, attached to it. Um, but yes, you kinda, you're kind of like handshaking with the, uh, when you decide to run the app on your machine, you're kind of saying, I agree to the terms and conditions of utilizing this app. You can put cookies on my machine, you can use my local storage, and you can follow where my mouse pointer is on the screen, and you can look at what I do while I use your website. Okay, um, Let's do something a little better than just console logging hello world. Let's console log. Uh, it was, let's see, there was something special about this one. It gave us something. Our callback can accept an argument. That might be worth looking at. I just want to see it once, though. I don't want to see it, like, every single time. So let's add another event listener called click. And we're going to look at whatever this E is. Can't imagine what it is. Uh, and we're just going to console log E. Let's take a look at this thing. Uh, there we go. Cool. Undefined. Okay, I'm going to click on the... Oh, they're still moving. E appears to have been a mouse event. And when I click on the disclosure triangle, I'm going to use that on every assistance request. I'm just going to say click on the disclosure triangle. Okay. Um, we see that it was a mouse event that happened. And we can see that we have a bunch of different things about it. Does it bubble? Yes, it does. Um, event propagation is not something that we're going to talk about today because you're just getting introduced to DOM events. Um, but you'll touch on this again later. Uh, what else? Is it cancelable? Who, who knew that a mouse click was cancelable? Cool. Um, is it composed? I don't know what the opposite of composed would be. Um, event phase. Ooh. We can see where the click happened. We have an X and Y offset. We can actually see what's going on. We can see a path that apparently was... Oh, the path to what's going on. Where that was clicked. Um, we can see a timestamp of the event. We can see the element that got clicked on. Apparently I clicked within the H1 when I did click. Um, we can see a bunch of different stuff about this. So let's make this a little bit more interactive. Let's do this and we'll pass in our E, whatever that E is, and we'll say E.ClientX, E.ClientY. Let's see this. Whoa, look at that. So that's our that's the x and y coordinates of the mouse pointer as it moves around the web page. And we're also still, because we still have that other event listener, we're still seeing hello, hello, hello over and over. Here, I'll, I will uh, refresh the page so we get rid of that. And there we go. Okay, so now we just have this. 
And every single time this event happens, our callback function gets run. And I, so hopefully I've made it clear to you that these events are happening all of the time. Hundreds, if not thousands of events are happening every single second. And it's just a matter of whether we are listening for those events or not. Okay. Um, the other thing is, like I said, JavaScript was written for this um, interface. How It was written specifically for the browser. So we have access to every single thing that you want inside here. So if you want to do something like, uh, what's something that you might want to do? Navigate to a previous page, JavaScript. History.back. Well, that sounds cool. Look at that. Apparently, we have access to this window object. OK. Refresh the page so we get rid of that. Ooh, hey, we do have access to the window object. What does the disclosure triangle tell us? <gasps> it's got a bunch of different stuff on it. And apparently, it has a hi oh, it does have a history. Look at that. History length 2. Let's check that out. OK, it goes back to. I'm not sure why history is length two. Presumably this page plus the starting page that I came from is our length two. Um, okay, so how do we navigate? Window.history.back. Cool. Window.history.back. And I'm presuming we have to invoke it. So um, uh, Nemo likes to say this is how this is how real programmers use the internet. <laughs> hey, open up your dev tools and just type it straight into there. Uh, so if you have a question about, can I do something? If it's dealing with manipulating this or retrieving information from this, yes, you can absolutely do it. Just Google it. And you'll get an answer probably very quickly about exactly how to do what you want to do. OK? Um, so we can interact with this thing. Let's go one of my favorite ones. If we want to select an element, we can use a query selector. So why don't we target our h1? And now we have retrieved the h1 element. Okay, We can actually store this in something. Let's say our h1 is document.query selector h1. OK, so what do we have now? We've got our H1. Well, what can we do with that? Holy cow, look at all the stuff we can do. So if I can type something in, if I can type the name of my variable in and then hit dot, and then I get a bunch of other stuff, what must H1 be? An object. Exactly, thank you. Object. That's exactly what it is. You're still writing JavaScript. I want, also want to make that clear. This is just JavaScript that we're writing in the browser. Um, we're just using various different APIs that you might not be familiar with, like document.querySelector to select a query. So what can we do with this? Well, the easiest thing to do, we can see that if we call h1.innerText, we get back the inner text. But why don't we change it to And now it's changed. We can actually do whatever we want with this. We could uh, add classes to it, presumably. How do we um, JavaScript browser add class? How to add a class name to an element. There we go. Element.classList.add. Awesome h1 dot class list dot add my class and now if we take a look at this element we see that our h1 now has a class of my class this is what we call dom manipulation because we are manipulating the document the document object model we are changing it in some way um, also you've seen it a couple of times but if I refresh the page Everything goes back. These are what are called client-side changes. Um, 
I'm only changing my version of it. And to really illustrate that, let's go to uh, New York Post. Is that going to be a good one? Hopefully nothing too terrifying. Vaping illnesses? This is terrible. We don't want to see this. Okay. So let's say that I really don't like this headline. Um, let's open our tools. Let's take a look at this headline. We see that it's H1 with a class of post ID dash 144-68654. Wow. Okay, cool. Let's clear this off. Document dot get element by class name. Is it elements by class name? And we're going to pass in a class name of, can I actually grab this? Hey, I can. Awesome. Copy that to the work, paste, awesome. We got back an HTML collection with two elements in it. The zero with element is apparently dot, dot, dot. And then we have our H1 here. So if I do that again, and we know that this is going to return an array-like object. So what did that give me? Document.getElement. That gives me my HTML collection, which has two elements inside of it. Elements by class name, and then we'll paste in our post ID. There we go. So we've got our H1 in there. Can we access the zero with element? No, it's giving us the whole thing. How do we access get element by class name? How are we doing for time? 1048. There's much easier ways to do this. Um, we normally don't actually use this. I want to show you the long way before we get into jQuery and do this in a much, much simpler way. I want to show you why we do this. Uh, it gives us back an HTML collection. Show some get element by ID. Okay. Well, anyway, um, on an easier to manipulate website, let's try an old faithful here, Wikipedia, and we'll go to a random article. That should be a little safer. Frederick Watley. ID is first heading. That's fantastic. So let's zoom in here. Document dot get element by ID, and it was called first heading, I believe. Nope. Oh. First heading. There we go. We've got our H1. And let's say we want to change what this page is about in our text. And we'll set that equal to. There we go. Now the article is about me. Now it's about someone else. We can grab things, various things within the page, and change them. Um, you don't usually do this on other people's websites unless you're trying to, you know, play a prank on somebody or something like that and upload a screenshot. And like, look, I finally made it into Wikipedia. You know, we're, there we go. My mom's going to be so proud. Finally. Um, hopefully only good things. Okay. Anyway. Um, that would be less of a surprise than I had a Wikipedia page about me. Hopefully she's like me and she just reads the headlines. So, um, generally we won't be manipulating other people's pages. We'll be manipulating our own page and we'll specifically set up our nodes to be easily hooked into. Okay. We'll set up our own classes and our own IDs and our own structure so that we can walk through it and find things a little bit easier. So, so far, uh, before we go to break, 10.50, we've been playing just inside of the console, right? This is the equivalent of the node REPL. We can manipulate the DOM. We can look around inside of it. But what if I want to bring in some JavaScript into this index page? How would I do that? Have you done any reading on how to bring in your JavaScript? Can I do what we were doing before? Const, you know, uh, 
Express equals require express. Is that going to work? No. Kind of, but not. Okay. That's okay. So for, for Victoria, uh, the answers were we could put it inside of script tags. Uh, we could put it in another file. We could link it. Um, we could download it from a CDN, which is what we'll be doing later. But it should probably come as no surprise to anyone that if I create a script tag, whatever I put inside of here is JavaScript. Back in the old days, and you might actually see some thing, you would have to do something like text JavaScript. But since JavaScript is the only scripting language on the internet now, we can just say script. And our browser knows, oh, that's, that's our old friend JavaScript. So let's get, uh, let's give this an ID to make it a little easier. My header, document.getElement by ID, my header, dot inner text equals I am famous ma there we go perfect now when we refresh this page for the briefest instant it actually did load up as what we had before which I think was my header yeah my header but it took a second so let's illustrate that with a little set timeout that takes two seconds Pull this out, throw it into there, and let's make sure that our script is running. Refresh the page, my header, and there we go. We also have the option to, very quickly, let's touch, uh, let's just call it script.js. There we go. We're going to cut all of this out. Put it straight into script.js. Good enough. There we go. And we can actually make reference to that with a source tag. We can actually just say point to script.js, load that up. And when we refresh, we see my header, which changes to I'm famous ma. So this is the, the way that we will more than likely be bringing in all of our scripts from now on. We'll write them in a separate file and then import them using this script syntax. Okay. Um, and 10.53, there we go. Why don't we take a 10-minute break, and when we come back, we will check how we're doing here and move on to jQuery. Awesome.
All right. 11.05. Are we ready to get going again? Eventually. All right. <clears throat> all right. Victoria's all there. Okay. So, uh, Anthony asked a question earlier about can you actually see how people interact with your websites? Can people actually do this? Uh, Hotjar is an app that you can use to find out where people have actually been clicking around on your website and what they've been doing while they were there. Uh, just an ex as an example of the information that you can glean from this. Um, the, I know there's the aspect of like, oh my god, big brother. Um, but there's also, hopefully there's some small part of you that like, wow, I can get that information. I can, might be able to use that information in some way. That might help me make a better app. That might help me um, create a more responsive app something like that where you can actually see where you can see these heat maps when it when the gif comes around again there we go of where people actually clicked on your website and it's super cool and super creepy at the same time cool all right so uh where are we we were looking at our thing let's jump back to our to-dos okay so we had an intro to the dom right we spoke briefly about dom events and we looked at various different ones uh we attacked a attached a click listener and a mouse move event listener, right? We looked at some of the browser objects. Um, the event object was that E that we were looking at. Uh, whenever an event fires, it encapsulates all the information about the event into an object and then passes that to your callback. So you can look at it and you can say, what time did it happen? What element was clicked on? What, what was the X and Y position of the mouse cursor? Stuff like that. Um, you can pull information from there. Uh, the window object, uh, we talked briefly about that, I believe. The, so the window object has information about the browser tab. Uh, so we could do something like width. Apparently it's 201. If I shrink it down, now it's 111. If I make the window bigger, it's 250. This is how you can use you could dynamically create, like, if it gets this big, I want to show something, but on small mobile devices, maybe I want to hide something. So you can say width. Is it less than this, greater than this? Then do something. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is pixels. This is in pixels here. So we're, we would say that this is 250 pixels wide. Um... Usually it's not an issue. Uh, usually you'll just figure it out and then convert it to whatever you need to do if you need to convert it to something else. If you need to say, like, what is it in relation to this or relation to that? Um, what else do we have? We have inner height. Apparently the inner height is 200. And the reason for that is because this is my entire window here. Like, this is, this is everything that's going on here is just inside of my web page. Uh, but the window object... Lots of cool stuff on there, as we can see. Animation events, all kinds of different stuff. Um, if you're interested in any of this stuff, just type it into Google, and you can see. Um, one of the things that's really neat, gamepad support. Uh, the All modern browsers have native gamepad support for up to four connected controllers. If you wanted to hook up a PlayStation controller or something that communicates over Bluetooth. You just Bluetooth connect it to your MacBook, and then you could use the buttons to manipulate things on the page. Uh, maybe you want to send instructions to something over the internet. This is, you can actually just grab the gamepad and use it right there. Um, we had a lecturer who took a Wii remote and used it to turn it into his clicker during presentations. So he could walk around and just click and move on to the next slide. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. There's Bluetooth. If you want to write code that sends information, sends data over Bluetooth, you can do that here. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. We can turn the camera on. Obviously, you need permission. We can look at window. Dot, where is my geolocation? 
Is it navigator? Geolocation. There we go. Oh, that's empty. Why is that empty? Huh, empty object. Get navigator geo location. HTML5 geolocation. Sounds fantastic. Browser support. Navigator dot get geolocation dot get current position. Awesome. Let's clear this. Paste that in. Is that going to work? Show position is not defined. Oh, because it's expecting a callback. Awesome. Uh, data console.log data undefined file colon can everybody see that if you're trying to access privileged information you need uh, the user to say yes for it this is why web pages will ask you is it okay if I use your microphone is it okay if I use your camera is it okay if I know your exact location your GPS coordinates this is why you need explicit permission because you don't just want somebody turning on your webcam. You don't just want somebody listening on your microphone, right? So this is to protect the user from malicious code. So if we say allow, let me try and run this again. Are we going to get that? Is it actually going to return a promise? That would be fun. Navigator dot geolocation dot get current position. Dot then console.log data. Is this going to work? Get current position on geolocation. One argument required. Anyway, you can see your. Seems like it's uh, not working very well for me today, but uh, you can actually see a user's uh, GPS coordinates, latitude and longitude. Oh, it wants to ask me every single time. There we go. Okay. Anyway, where were we? Back to the browser events. Event, window, navigator. We saw that we could see the history, right? And document is obviously our DOM. Any questions about the first half of the lecture? No? We're good? Okay, cool. So, jQuery. I know you did some reading on this, and uh, you've probably already started to use it, so what is jQuery? It's an API. Fantastic. It is an API. It is. It's a JavaScript library that allows us to easily do. There's three major things that I can think of that we would want to do with JavaScript on the client side. One of them we've already been practicing, DOM manipulation, right? Um, what else could we do? What else did we demonstrate this morning uh, with our, so we did DOM manipulation here. We changed the inner text, right? Um, what about when I was moving the mouse pointer around the screen? DOM events, exactly. We can attach listeners to DOM events. So we can do DOM event handling. And then the last major one that instantly comes to mind for me is asynchronous retrieval of information. And this one, we're not going to talk about at all today. This one will be for a future lecture, but it's one of my favorite technologies, Ajax. Um, okay, so it's a J JavaScript library that allows us to easily perform these things. Um, is it something new? What language is it written in? You want, you want to say it? JavaScript. That is exactly right. It is written in 
JavaScript. That's exactly what it is. Um, we have talked about this previously. Like, why did we bring in Express when we were creating our RESTful APIs? Node can create HTTP APIs right out of the box. Why did we bring in Express? Why did we bring in Morgan to log things to the console? Why did we bring in the body parser to parse the body and put it onto the request object? It is. It's a lot, a lot more laborious. Sure, we'll go with that. To uh, use vanilla JS. So out of the box JS. We bring it into our projects to make our lives easier. There's nothing that's in jQuery that you could not write yourself. It's absolutely just wrapping things like document.getElementById, document.getElementsByClassName, stuff like that. All the things that we've been doing, it just wraps them in an API and makes them a little easier for us to consume so that we can focus on what we want to do and not how do we do it. Instead of saying, well, how do I select something? We have a nice, simple API for that. How do I change this text? We have a nice, simple API for that. How do I add a class to it? Simple API, right? So we can actually look at, if we go to jQuery, and jQuery actually has fantastic documentation. You can't often say that about libraries, uh, but the jQuery docs are awesome. Uh, let's go to jQuery CDN first. Does everyone know what a CDN is? Has anyone ever heard of a CDN? Victoria, no? OK, uh, CDN is a content delivery network. So in other words, this entire network has been set up simply to deliver content. OK, that was, that was bad. Um, it is a, a particular type of web server that hosts very frequently accessed files, um, such as jQuery or Moment or various different other packages that you would want to utilize in your code base so that you don't have to serve it up from your web server. Because that is an option. You could download jQuery, and then every time somebody comes to your page, they don't just get, they don't just get your HTML and your JavaScript, but they would also get jQuery. Okay? Um, there's a lot of disadvantages to that. Uh, it can make your page take a lot longer to load because you're sending up file sizes, like much larger files, because uh, jQuery is actually quite a big library. Um, the other advantage that using a CDN has over serving up our own files is that there's caching. Your browser will cache it. So if, you're, if we've already gone to Wikipedia, then we already have jQuery loaded in our browser. So when we go to another website that uses jQuery, instead of bothering to download it, it just says, oh, I know what jQuery is. I've already got that downloaded. And then you just continue on. So uh, our apps will load faster. Um, so we generally, in the browser, try to use a CDN. Um, we will change that in React Week. We'll build apps more like Node, but that's because they're compiled applications. Um, for right now, if you want to use something, just pull it in with a CDN. And generally, you just type in the name of the package that you want, follow it with CDN, and you'll get a nice link to which version do you want. And do you want it uncompressed, minified, slim, or slim minified? Um, so let's take a look at what uncompressed looks like. Hey, what does that look like? Document equals window dot document. Slice equals r dot slice. Concat equals r dot concat. What does this, what does this look like? Remember, there's no trick questions. It's just JavaScript. That's it. That's exactly what it is. All of this is JavaScript. And if you took the time, you could actually read through jQuery. And you could see, like, oh, jQuery.extend. OK, jQuery.fn.extend. Sure. Some kind of function with, I mean, we're setting i equals 1. Sure. Length is arguments.length. Fantastic. Um, this is all just JavaScript. Okay, It's just wrapping internal functions and internal things that we could utilize to make our lives easier. So this is the uncompressed version. 
And as you can see, I don't know if you can see my scroll bar on the side, but this is a massive file. So usually what you'll see is the minified version, which takes all of the variable names. If we go all the way back up to the top. It takes all the variable names and just turns them into like A, B, C, D, E, F. And it just runs through your code and gets rid of all of the places where you're verbose. It will remove all of your comments, stuff like that, just to make the file size load faster. But it's impossible to read at this point. So don't try and read minified code, but this is what minified code looks like. Okay, so we need to be able to bring this into our project. This looks like a website that's serving it up. Uh, let us create a new directory, call it jQuery, index.html, and app.js. Awesome. Okay, let's get those up here. Okay. So our index.html, I'm going to close this. There we go. We'll just use the scaffolding. There we go. jQuery fun. Awesome. Now, we want to bring jQuery in. So we want to utilize that CDN, right? I copied the link from up here. So I copied the link that points to this file. So in order to bring it in, all we have to do is set the source of a script tag. What are you objecting to? There we go. Awesome. That's it. Now we have jQuery. So if I want to take advantage of jQuery, I want to write some code in here. Oh, like, I want to write my DOM manipulation code in here and my event listeners in here. What do I have to do with my app.js? I need to bring it in with another script tag, right? So where do I put that one? Can I put it here? Is that going to work? Console.log jQuery. Copy path. Let's open it in a browser. And Hello world, we got that. So at least we know it's loading up our file. Um, I'll often put little things like this in there. Just put it in like a console log, like hi or something. And then at least you know that you're bringing it in. The other thing we can do is we can look in the network tab. We can refresh. And if we look under JS, we can see that app.js was successfully loaded as well as jQuery was successfully loaded. Okay. Um, you can see those here. You could see all, like everything that got loaded, or you can filter down by looking at the different options. You could see, did my CSS get loaded? Has my JS been loaded? Did my Ajax request go through? Oh, Ajax, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. So here we go. So we know that it was loaded up, but I got a reference error. jQuery is not defined. We just looked in the network tab and we saw that we successfully downloaded jQuery, but I got jQuery is not defined. What's wrong with my code? Let's find out. Hey, that looks a little better. I got a function of some kind, return new jQuery and no error. That's exactly right. Your code is executed from the top to the bottom of the file. So if you want to utilize JavaScript from another package, you need to require that, bring it into your code, above your code. So if we were bringing in other packages, like we brought in like Bootstrap or something, the JavaScript one, so we could do dynamic uh, manipulation, we would bring that in as well. And if it required jQuery, we'd have to bring it in in here, bring in bootstrap. That's obviously not a HTML comment, but, but the order absolutely matters. Um, so if you're seeing some things that are like reference error, or this variable is not defined, or I can't do what I want to do, take a look at the order of your scripts. Okay. Now, 
Let's see what we can do with jQuery. We'll have a nice, simple title, and maybe we'll add on a button. Uh, we'll give the idea a button of my button. Uh, click me. There we go. Okay. So, we don't need to console log anymore. Let's use some jQuery. Um, can I... Let's just do something simple first. What does this evaluate to? Let's find out. Hey, true. And look at that. A title and a button. Let me click on the button. True. jQuery dollar sign. They point to the exact same function the exact same object in memory. So we can use jQuery to access something, or we can use the dollar sign syntax to access something. And you'll see this is kind of a theme in jQuery that they have been constantly kind of iterating since it came out. I think jQuery was created in 2008 or 2009. Um, and they are constantly making new helper functions that will help us out to shorten our syntax, to make the code that we have to write much, much less. Uh, what is it they say on the jQuery? Query. There we go. Where did it, where did it go now? What? It's not actually on there. It's just on here. Okay, we'll have to look at the little preview here. jQuery, the write less, do more JavaScript library. So that's kind of their their claim to fame, that we can do things that we could do with vanilla JavaScript, but we can write a lot less code, and we can get it done. Just like we could now bootstrap uh, an Express web server in a matter of minutes, right? You could get a website up and running, you could get your server up and sending information within a couple of minutes, right? Um, same thing with jQuery. This is going to make it nice and easy for us to grab things. So where are we? jQuery fun. I want to close that and make sure that we're Okay, so let's see what we had to do before. Before we had to do document.query selector and stuff like that, right? jQuery, we don't need to do that. We can actually just pass a string as an argument to the jQuery function, and that'll grab something for us. So let's look for, what is our index.html? It's got an h1. Let's grab that h1. And we can set that equal to a variable. And then let's console log it, see what it looks like. So we want to grab that h1 using jQuery. Remember, either way, dollar sign or jQuery. And then we're going to console log what's in there. Refresh. jQuery length 0. We didn't actually get anything. My h1 selector is empty. I didn't actually get this h1. Remember when we had document.get element by ID and we were able to uh, query selector? h1. Of course it is. There we go. We were able to grab it. But this one's not giving me anything. jQuery ran. No errors. But... I didn't get anything. How come? Let's do. Here's the app.js, and here's the index.html. Which file contains the error? Sorry? Anybody? Which of these two files? We only have two files. Which of these two files contains the error? Contains the reason why my code is not working as I would want it to. Why, when I console log this h1, am I not actually seeing an h1 here? I'm seeing length 0, an empty selector. Our code executes. It's, it, this might be, does this qualify as a trick, trick question, trick answer? Um, the answer is both. There are steps that we could do in both files that would fix this error for us. This error is coming out because coming about because our 
file is being read from the top to the bottom. So we are bringing in our scripts and we're trying to select elements of the DOM before they've been created. So when we try to grab this H1 inside of this file, this H1 doesn't exist yet. It's not part of the DOM. If we grab these two and move them up, is that going to fix my step back? There we go. So now we have our script tags at the bottom and we refresh this page. Hey, now I got an H1. I was actually able to grab the H1 element and we can start manipulating it. Do you see the difference there? Because it's loaded from top to bottom, if the element's not in the DOM yet, you can't select it. Okay, your code's gonna run, and what we're saying here, uh, do you know that query is another word for question, right? So we're saying, hey, jQuery, look inside the DOM and look for something that's an H1. And at this point, when it runs, the DOM is practically empty. It's got the head and the title and stuff like that, but it certainly does not have an H1 in it. So it came back and went, meh, I didn't find anything. And then if we tried to manipulate it, it would go, meh, good luck. It's not actually going to do anything um, because of the order that happened here. Okay? So a good rule of practice, a good rule of practice, a good rule of thumb is always put your script tags at the bottom of the body. There is something else that jQuery does to help us out. It gives us a little helper function. And that helper function wraps the document object. So we are just saying, pass the document object to jQuery, to this function. And when the document is ready, execute this callback function. And if we move this into here, save that, and move these back up where they were, and refresh our page, we see that we still have access to that H1. Okay? Um, so, what this is saying is, wait. It's, we can tell it's asynchronous because we're passing a callback, right? We can tell it's going to execute at some point in the future. So we're saying, when the document emits the ready event, execute this callback function. So that's another way of saying, wait until everything is in memory, wait until all the, the DOM nodes have been loaded before I start to manipulate the code. You can do either one, you can do both. I would argue that in a professional environment, you would want to do both. Uh, just quickly before we get too off topic, why would, we, why would this be a concern? Why would we want to do both? We've already demonstrated that this is fine, this is enough, and this is enough. Why, why do we need to do both of these? It, it comes from something that you may or may not be familiar with already, which is working on a team. If you are in charge of, generally when you go to work, it's not going to be like, okay, just have at it whatever you want to do, you're going to get assigned a particular thing. Maybe you're going to create an index.html page or a particular page. And then someone else on your team is going to be tasked with making that page reactive and wiring it up. But if you say, well, you know, I always use document.ready so I can move my script tags to the top here. What has that put on your coworker? It's forcing them to remember to wrap it in a document.ready, right? Or vice versa, if it's your job to write the JavaScript, you would say, well, I always put my script tags at the bottom of the body, duh. Why, do I, why would I bother to wrap it in a document ready? But again, then you've put it, the onus on your coworker to make sure that your code will execute properly, okay? So always make sure that it's not your code that's gonna be the shortcoming of the team, okay? So if you're writing the jQuery, wrap it in a document.ready function. If you're writing the HTML, put it at the bottom of the body. Okay? That way, you're doing your part to make sure that the app doesn't break. And you're less reliant on your coworkers doing a good job. Um, because you've all had jobs before, and you've all had coworkers that you wouldn't trust to do much of anything. Right? 
Okay. So, unfortunately, same thing in the programming world. There's going to be programmers that you're like, ah, don't touch my code. I don't trust you. Okay, cool. So now we've got our jQuery in here. Let's do some things that we were doing before that took a little while to get going. Let's do something like set the text. Uh, let's change the text on this H1 to, um, let's do the I'm famous again, for lack of a famous. There we go. Okay, so we're going to grab that H1 and we're going to set its text. Refresh. Hey, look at that. You'll notice that we didn't call before we had to grab the, the element, let's just say element, and then we called inner HTML on it, right? And then we did this because it was actually a prop. It's not a method. In jQuery, our, the API gives us a dot text method that allows us to set the text on an object. If we don't give it, I'll just console log. If we don't give it an argument, we'll just get back the text. If we refresh this, see, we just got back the text. So these functions are multi-purpose. It's, it's smart enough to say, to look inside here and say, did you give me an argument? No, you didn't. Okay, so you must want the text. Oh, you did give me an argument. You must want me to set the text. Easy. Change that. Let's do, um, we could set that on a timer if we wanted. What was the other one that we did? We attached an event listener. Let's do it on, let's grab the body. And let's add an event listener. Before we did whatever the element was, and then we did add event listener, and then we had to say the name of the event, and then pass a callback function, right? So, same thing here. Mouse over, pass a callback function. What are our events going to get passed? They're going to get past the event object, right? So, here's our event object. And just for fun, let's do, let's change this to click for a second, because I want to look at this event object. So we have a body on click, and we'll just console log the event object. And right below that, let's do document dot query selector body. Uh, and then we'll add event listener. Do another click. And we'll get this event as well. And I want to console log this event. Okay, so we should get two console logs. Let's uh, make this look a, better, a little bit better with our chaining. There we go. Okay, so we've added two event listeners. One with jQuery. And one the old-fashioned way. Okay, let's take a look at what objects we get back. Uncaught reference area, body's not defined. Uh, do, do, do. Happy now? Okay, we got I'm famous. Now we're going to click on the body and check it out. This is the mouse event. We looked at this one before. And this is where we were able to pull off the client X and Y and everything. This is the regular event. This is something called the jQuery event. And if we open this up, we can see that it has an original event property on it, which is this event, this mouse event. Um, we have that under wherever the original event, there it is, original event. This is this entire, what is that, uh, the disclosure triangle. Yeah, if we click on the disclosure triangle, we get this thing. But like everything jQuery does, it's wrapped it for us and given us even more functionality on top of that. So I want you to see that although we're grabbing the event, we're, this is actually what's known as jQuery event. So if you're Googling for things, make sure that you're Googling for jQuery event and not DOM event, okay? Because you have access to the DOM event, but it's wrapped inside of this larger object called a jQuery event, okay? And this will have props on it that aren't in vanilla JavaScript. Okay. Any questions about event handling or anything like that as we move on? Nothing so far? Awesome.
Okay, so I'm just going to leave this here. And let's switch back to mouse over. And I just want to do this exactly what we did before with our event. Uh, do we have client X? Is that going to work? Yes. There we go. And let's console log event dot client Y. Hey, look at that. Magic. It is, and this is because our, our actual entire document is so small. That's why I have to get up into this top corner to move around. Because down here, you see that I attach this to the body, but the body doesn't extend down to here. There's no content down here. So I move it around up here. So we're in a similar situation to our promise versus callback heck survey app. We're getting the exact same functionality, different implementation under the hood. At the end of the day, who cares? If you need to know what the X and Y coordinates are of the mouse, use jQuery, use vanilla JavaScript, use whatever you need to do. Use the API that gives you the answer that you need. Okay? These are just tools to be utilized. You choose the correct tool for the job. You could use your shoe to bang a nail into a wall, but you could also use a hammer. Right? And one will be a lot more effective than the other one, presumably, unless you have really good shoes. Um, awesome. What else can we do with... We've done very basic, so we did a little bit of DOM manipulation. We can change the text. Uh, let's listen to a button click. What did I call that button? ID of my button. Let's grab that. So this jQuery utilizes CSS selectors. So if I was going to style a button with an ID of my button, how would I select it for my CSS? Hashtag. Thank you. Hashtag. What was it? My button? I'm terrible. There we go. Okay. My button. Dot on. We could do whatever we want. We could pass in double click if we want. Only when it gets double clicked. We could pass in dot click. And in fact, these functions have been around for so long. Let's look at jQuery dot click. It actually says it right there. So we have this dot click method, and it says this method is a shortcut for dot on click and passing in the handler. So this is equivalent to this. We have two different interfaces that we can use. Because this was so commonly done that jQuery said, well, you know, we could write a little helper method so that you don't have to specify that it's a click. You can just write the word click. That happens all the time. Um, why would both of these methods still be available to us? That's correct. Reverse compatibility is exactly right. If jQuery just decided, you know what, jQuery 3 is out, we don't support all this, this on syntax because now we have this dot click syntax, then websites would start to break if they were to upgrade. So for reverse compatibility, backwards compatibility, we still have access to these cla classic methods, but we also have access to all the new things that are coming along. So when you Google, because jQuery has been out for a decade now, um, when you Google, you're going to get various different answers depending on what year the responder answered the question in. But like I said, if it gets the job done, who cares ultimately? If you want to do everything with dot on and then the name of the event and then pass the callback function, that's great. If, if, if you prefer the dot click syntax, also great. They will both work. So I'm just going to comment this out here. And we're going to, I'm going to introduce you to something, possibly not introduce you to something. The, web's de the web dev's second best friend. Does anyone know what the alert function does? Makes a pop-up message. That's exactly right. Because everyone knows. Oh, when I click. Everyone knows that users of browsers love pop-up mes messages, right? Everybody loves this. This is perfect web design. You can tell I, I specialize in backend. Okay? Um, web dev's second best friend. Fantastic. We didn't have access to this alert 
function in the server. We couldn't just type in alert, right? This is something extra that's built into ours. And I have a sneaking suspicion. If we clear this off, alert. Window.alert. Hey, hey, check it out. So these are actually props on the window object. You can look at the window object like we had the global object in the server. If we go over here, node console.log global. Hey, there's our global object. This is our, our global node object. So when we say, when you declare like, uh, name is a terrible one. Uh, let's say, let's do something lower. Aardvarks are awesome. There we go. And then if we console on global and scroll all the way up to the top, we should be able to see there's inside of our process. Wow, nothing's working out for me today. Somewhere on here should be our, um, our because we've registered it on the global scope, it'll be on the global object, our variable. Same thing here, we've got our window, and we can access all these different properties. We've got window.navigator, we've got window.document. This is just another way of getting to all these things, okay? And then the disclosure triangles will let you look at it. That's the number one takeaway. This lecture should have been called disclosure triangles. I think it, it will be in the future. Okay, so where were we? So we've seen that with very, very simple code, we can do a lot of different stuff, right? Um, what else can we do with jQuery? Element creation. There we go. So we may end up with, let's say we have an unordered list, perhaps of tweets, you might say. But let's give this an ID of uh, list container. Great. So let's add the first, my first list item. How are we doing for time? Oh, Carl let everybody out early. Awesome. Okay. So we refresh this. Oh, let me turn that off because that's a little annoying. I'm going to leave the alert though because alerts are not annoying at all. Okay, there we go. So now we still have the alert. Fantastic. OK, so now we have this unordered list on our web page. Currently contains one item. Well, let's add some items to that. What is the syntax for creating a new list item? What do I pass to the jQuery function? Would I just pass like an li like this? No, that's right. Uh, we'd pass in something like this. So jQuery is saying, this is a selector. It says, jQuery, look through the DOM for an ally. This says, create a new ally for me. OK? And then let's do something like set its text to uh, another list item. There we go. And then we can grab the, what did I call it? List container? Yes. List dash container. And we can prepend the list item to that. Cool. Why don't we wrap this inside the click so we can actually see it happen? OK, refresh the page. We have one list item. We click. Now we have another one. We click, now we have another one, and another one, and another one. You can imagine that, let's say somebody's typing in a tweet, you know, per se, and then you want to grab that information from the form, from that input field, and output it into a list. Well, you can say, whenever this button gets clicked, perform this action. Read whatever was in, let's say, this input field, why don't we add an input field onto here so I can demonstrate this? Input type equals text. Uh, ID equals my input. And self-closing tag. So now we have 
an input field on here. And the idea is that whatever we type into here, when you hit click me, it will add it to this list. Okay? We still have 10 minutes left. Awesome. Okay. So we need to be able to grab this thing, right? We can use jQuery to do that. So inside of our dot click, I'm going to just clean up some of these comments so we don't get too confused here. Inside of our dot click, instead of doing this, we want to retrieve that text from somewhere, right? So const text equals, let's grab from my input, and we want dot val. This is different because in here, these are not actually text nodes. Or sorry, these are text nodes, absolutely. In here, this is not a text node. This is, in fact, a value node. Okay? So this is text that's rendered to the screen. This is text that a user types in. We access this with dot val. So I'm going to grab my input, and I'm going to get the value from it. And then I'm going to sub that in right here. Dot text will be the text that we just grabbed here. Let's see how this works. Is this working? And click me. Hey, check it out. That'll do whatever. Whatever. This is why I never get anything done. Because I just spend all my time doing this. Um, so you can see that we can perform DOM manipulation. We can do attach event listeners. Everything with very little code. Like, you probably wouldn't think that if we just get rid of all of this, we got four lines of code here, and we were able to read input from an input field, listen for a button click, and then update the DOM by taking the information from this field and adding, turning it into a list item and appending it to the DOM. All in, if we get rid of our alert, five lines of code. And in fact... I could have inlined this instead of putting it into a variable. I could have just in put it right into there, and we could do this in like three lines of code. Okay, This is why jQuery became absolutely massive. This and browser support, but browser support is less of a concern nowadays. You might see old uh, CSS things that say like dash webkit, dash prefix, and stuff like that, right? They had these different prefixes. We don't need to deal with that anymore because the web has become like a standardized environment. But this is the power of jQuery. This is why it became so popular. It was the perfect tool at the perfect time, and everybody loves it. And it allows fantastic DOM manipulation, gives us really easy syntax, especially when you get to Ajax. You know, spoilers for tomorrow, but when you get into that, much, much better. Okay, so seven more minutes. I want to introduce you to something else as well. What's the difference between these two lines? In particular, what's the difference between the variable names? I have a const text, but I don't have a const list item. I put something extra on there. Sorry, somebody say dollar sign? Yay! Awesome, everybody's awake. I know it's almost lunchtime. Okay, so I attached a dollar sign onto here, and you'll see this in examples. You'll see this in other people's code. This is what's called, believe it or not, Hungarian notation. Yes. It's an identifier naming convention in computer programming in which the name of the variable or function indicates its intention or kind, as in data type. So Hungarian notation is a way of attaching metadata about the variable in the variable's name. You might see this in other programming languages. You might see like string equals my string, and then you know that that is a string type. Uh, things like that. You might see like const int to show that it's an integer type, to show that other devs who read your code go, oh, okay, my num is supposed to be an integer. My string is supposed to be a string. I understand. We don't do this in JavaScript because it's not a strictly typed language, right? Um, but as we saw when I console logged, jQuery wraps our stuff 
in a massive object with a whole bunch of other methods and things like that. So you'll see Hungarian notation of adding a dollar sign to the front so that other devs know and that you're reminded. This is not just a variable. This is a jQuery object with a whole bunch of different methods and properties on it. Whereas this is just plain text. That's just a regular primitive. We read from, because I didn't set it to this, I set it to this. I said, get back the value from that, right? So that's why I didn't put the dollar sign on here. So when you're reading through documentation, you'll often see a dollar sign prepended onto it. And that simply says, hey, this is a jQuery object. You can do more stuff with this than you could just do with a regular variable. Okay. Uh, what else might we want to do? Presumably, let's grab my input again. And let's clear it. That should have worked, hopefully. Refresh the page. This is still neat. Click me. Hey, that's nice, right? But it didn't, you'll notice, let's look at, uh, we've got a couple minutes left, some just little improvements that we can make. Uh, what's happening here? Click. But the focus is now on the button, right? I can't just continue clicking because my focus has been moved to that button. We were able to successfully clear it. There's no way this is going to work, is it? Oh, yeah. Continuous typing. Okay, so a couple of things. One, we can continue chaining on. Uh, the great thing about jQuery values is they follow the object-oriented programming of returning it every single time. So when we say dot prepend, we get back the original list item again. So we could continue saying, oh, OK, now I want you to append something on. And now I want you to prepend. And maybe I want you to set focus. Maybe I want you to add a class. You can chain them all on, because whatever your original selector was keeps getting returned to you. So you can keep manipulating it. We didn't have to do this on two separate lines and copy this out again, set the value to nothing, and then set the focus on it. Right? We can do that all in one line. You can just chain it all along. And generally, the thing will be very, very simple. If you just typed in jQuery set focus on form input dot focus, it's right there. Comes back immediately. Inbuilt method in jQuery, which allows you to focus on an element. Anything that you want to do, just Google it. Add the word jQuery to it, and you'll be able to see pretty much anything that you want to do can be done. Okay? Uh, where else are we? 11.58. Any questions? Anything you'd like to see demonstrated? Did this answer any questions for you? Has this been helpful in any way? Yes. Uh, you can do various different animations. Let's take a look at the documentation. jQuery animation. jQuery effects. W3 schools will probably have a nice little thing that we can click through. Uh, so dollar sign selector. Well, that's dot animate. Take some parameters, a speed of the animation, and then, hey, our old friend, the callback function. Great. So animate left 250 pixels. Let's try it ourselves. Okay, let's run this. And then start the animation. Ooh, nice. It doesn't reset. But it'll animate and move it to the right. And again, that was a single line of code that moved this smoothly across the page. And I believe that, what did it say? Dot animate and left. It said that we could pass in parameters and a speed. Uh, let's pass in 3,000 milliseconds. Try that again. Nope, don't save. Run. Start the animation. Oh, yeah. Like molasses in January. Run. And that's a little speedier. So we've got all these. And then we can also do something like pass in a callback function. Animation is done. Uh, let's make this an alert <laughs> so that it will actually show up. Uh, oops, I keep hitting 
Command S. Start the animation, and it's done, and then animation is done. Let's see that a little slower. It's, I'm hard-coded to do Command S. I just can't help it. Runs, 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 and then it's done. Because you can imagine that maybe you were moving this for a reason. Maybe you were sliding that across the screen, and when it's finished, you want to do something else. Well, you just pass in a callback to do that. And that callback gets fired when the animation's complete. Um, did that kind of touch on the animations? That was a much better demo than I could have com come up with. Uh, and there's various different things. Um, W3 Schools is great for experimenting with. I love being able to just click through the try it yourself. Um, MDN is kind of like where we should go to get the hard data about what we're doing. Uh, that's the real documentation, but W3 Schools is kind of fun to just play around in here. Um, does anyone know where the W3 came from? Just for interest's sake. Why this is called W3 Schools. The World Wide Web, exactly. That's exactly right. Um, anything else? 1201. Awesome. Anything for Victoria? Nope, nothing. Great. Um, fantastic. Enjoy jQuery. Have fun manipulating the DOM. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria.